At this point, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Gretchen Daly, the founder and faculty director of the Natural Capital Project and the Bing Professor of Environmental Science at Stanford University. The title of her talk is Accounting for Natural Capital, From Demonstration to Transformation. Well, I want to say first off, I'm really grateful to have been invited. This has been a tremendous uh, workshop and I've learned a ton and really appreciated the many um, realms of expertise that people have been putting forth to um, sort of stimulate this conversation about what we can do in the realm of natural climate solutions and um, in harmony with the much bigger picture and set of goals we're trying to achieve <laughs> some of the toughest goals humanity has ever pursued. So um, I love the quote you ended with there, Joe, from Martin Luther King on good science being compassionate science. And um, in that spirit, I'd love to dive in. I'll try to connect a bit with the um, presentations made over the past couple of days and um, just lay out uh, the arena that was put forth to me, namely, how do we account for natural capital? How do we value nature, essentially, in decision making? Um, and how can we move, especially what I'd like to address a bit here is from demonstration at relatively small scales. So um, the scales are certainly increasing impressively, but whether it's fast enough is the big question. So how do we move from demonstration to real system-wide transformation in um, harmonizing people and nature? So I'd like to just hit on the key frontiers and basically my take homes that are number one, there's been this massive science advances over the past decade or two in this arena, especially in the past 10 years, new science, uh, new data, allowing us to um, run calculations that were undreamed of before in looking at sort of the return on investment um, in nature's benefits to people and in economic security and recovery with um, really targeted approaches. So we need to enhance use of this data and science to better target our investments. Second, in scaling, there is a lot of deep experience on which we can build, uh, much of which remains still kind of little known and poorly shared between countries and regions and the institutions implementing it. So another arena in which we could accelerate is in scaling success. And third, and excuse me, finally, I'd like to emphasize um, the tremendous need to come up with um, new metrics that let us track performance, whether it's of policies or the entities meant to implement and evaluate them. Uh, there are also some really promising advances being made here um, that we urgently need to integrate much more widely into, for example, the climate um, conversations we're having today. So the overarching questions when we think about, um, you know, achieving climate security, especially through natural climate solutions, um, in the context of all the pressures on land and on kind of the earth system broadly, the three that really come to the fore um, are, you know, how much and where should we be protecting ecosystems and in what way? Second, you know, how can we harmonize people and nature and specifically, how can we secure nature through conservation and restoration and at the same time secure human livelihoods and then third, um, how can we move beyond GDP as the dominant um, metric that is um, so fundamental in many key realms of decision making? So just to tie in a little bit to the past couple of days, a couple of presenters, um, and then Sarah, you nicely summed up this morning, sort of noting the tremendous potential for natural climate solutions shown here to help drive the reduction in emissions and actually you know reverse all that in the near term um, but also the many constraints um, that we face and the worries over massive shift 
rights and land use um, that might trigger other dramatic problems, um, economic, social, political, um, as well as just the biophysical challenges of providing enough food, energy, access, and other um, fundamental sort of human needs. So if we look further at this paper, the nice analysis by Griscom and others, you, this also was shown in the past couple of days, there are these sort of climate mitigation pathways um, involving different ecosystem types on the left, forests, ag lands, pasture lands, grasslands, broadly wetlands. And um, the analysis focused on their climate mitigation potential. And then there's this little box uh, down at the bottom and these little tiny bars on the left of the vertical axis showing what the other benefits might be. And what I'd now like to dive into with those questions we have in mind, like of starting with, you know, where and how much to protect. Um, let's look at those other sort of co-benefits that would come along with these strategies. How do we estimate, um, you know, how much to protect in the way of, of, for example, let's just get into land, you know, where do we draw the line between, let's say, agricultural lands and um, tropical forest lands? How much in any given, you know, region or country um, would we need to protect and what in some sense would be optimal under different Let's use Martin Luther King's criterion, you know, a compassionate, um, at the same time, realistic, equitable kind of approach. What about with biodiversity? You know, which um, elements of biodiversity are likely to survive the human impacts? How can we foster those that are most important um, to human well-being and hopefully also in some broader ethical uh, dimensions? whether it's bees for pollination, the vast majority of our, you know, our nutrition really comes from the fruits, nuts, veggies, and other pollinated um, crops that we grow. There's tremendous uh, benefits provided by birds like this pair of royal flycatchers um, that um, conduct natural pest control. Then there's things that we've just got to be a lot more aware of. Here's a big pest control agent in the middle, this um, fabulous largest bat uh, that's carnivorous in the new world, spectral bat. Um, yet, so it goes around eating those flycatchers, also a lot of insects and things. But um, we know that uh, many of our scariest diseases come from bats and biodiversity isn't 100% a positive thing. We've got to be sort of much more aware and sophisticated when it comes to our analyses and plans for manipulating biodiversity and understanding where we really need to protect to minimize the kind of disruption that we're facing now with the global pandemic. And finally, just touching on water here, looking at a wonderful expanse of the Amazon up into the highlands in Ecuador, um, we know that forest plays a crucial role in many dimensions of water supply, whether it's storage and flows for drinking, irrigation and hydropower, or flood control, protection of downstream communities and property, or um, famously for the Amazon, but also for many other forest systems, um, a powerful influence on atmospheric circulation of water and on precipitat sorry, precipitation patterns in many regions that could be severely disrupted with um, widespread further deforestation. So how do we think about um, all of this in an integrated way? What we really want to know here taking kind of an economic production function approach, teeing up Larry Goulder in a minute maybe, um, is you know, what kind of implications would come from alternative changes in management or policy on the left, such as a decision to restore habitat and maybe reduce some of the cropland area, changing ecosystem structure, protecting streamside habitat to improve 
uh, this ecosystem function of water filtration and retention to improve, let's say, in a region like California or in much of Asia where you have precipitation just in certain parts of the year, uh, water retention and meeting it out for irrigation, hydropower, and drinking year-round, um, <clears throat> and improving water quality, um, leading to many benefits, including, and now I can't quite see what's on my far right, but um, reduced treatment costs and other benefits to people. So what we want to be able to do is conduct this kind of analysis in a lot of different arenas. These arenas are shown here, you know, everything with climate security up there very prominently um, as an overarching arena, um, encompassing coastal climate protection, urban cooling, food production, flood control, just water and energy production broadly, um, and then various aspects of health many other types and sort of classes of benefits that we want to be able to analyze in an integrated way to know how much and where to protect and how to harmonize across all of these, um, in some ways, competing objectives for the land uh, and other resources across Earth's surface. So um, there's been a large community that's developed models in each of these areas, some for, you know, in traditions going back decades in some arenas, especially in water modeling and other um, <clears throat> parts of the system, food and agricultural modeling, other areas such as mental health, especially very new, or some elements of, say, uh, modeling food production and agricultural systems, like in pollination services from nature or pest control services being very new. So all of these are being integrated through the Natural Capital Project into a sort of modeling a data and modeling software platform for integrated valuation of ecosystem or environmental services and trade-offs. And this is being widely used mostly um, well, in a number of realms across most countries Still, I'd say a long way to go to um, mainstream this kind of approach, but I'll show you some of the most powerful examples of actually driving this into planning and practice today. So the idea is to take all the data that are streaming in through different sensing technologies, take these <clears throat> questions and the new understanding we have in science of the values of nature embedded, for example, here within agricultural systems um, and using the software to inform decisions and drive real impact um, in changing land management and the financing thereof to make it all uh, basically possible to harmonize kind of people and nature. So here's an example run for IPES, the IPCC for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services that has just recently been set up and delivered its first assessment report in 2019. And what I want to emphasize here, it's a lot of maps, but the point is if you look across the top, there's three services of about 18 that were modeled um, that really operate on a very fine scale. And now for the first time, thanks to these advances in, in the technology and the data streams coming in and the modeling by many, many groups worldwide in many of these arenas, we can model at a very fine scale um, things such as water quality regulation, coastal risk reduction by mangroves, seagrass beds, coral reefs and such, and crop pollination by you know, little bees and other types of insects primarily. Um, so it's quite um, a major improvement in our ability to project, you know, what the benefits are being um, provided across the world under current conditions, what populations are most vulnerable or exposed and have the greatest need for nature's contributions so that you can see where people's greatest needs line up with uh, nature's greatest potential contributions and make forecasts aligned with the IPCC's type of 
forecast for the future. I won't get into that further now, but what I'd like to do is kind of just emphasize that we can do this at very fine scales anywhere in the world now, even in quite data poor regions, there are enough data to um, link the human and some aspects of the economic and social dimensions of a place with the provision of these benefits of nature and project uh, the implications of alternative decisions or development plans. So I'm going to show you um, a couple of examples now and um, <clears throat> we'll emphasize Latin America and China. So there are, I'd say, thousands of examples now worldwide. Those shown here um, really demonstrate at scale, an impressive scale, um, how to integrate this understanding into investments. And so Costa Rica really kicked it all off. It's a famous case, probably most of you are familiar with it. So I'll start there just going back to 1997 with um, just some really brilliant, innovative leaders of the country at the time, including Alvaro Maña and um, setting up the first national payment system worldwide for the provision of these benefits or ecosystem services and paying people through a variety of financial um, payment streams, some international from European investments in a trial period back then, um, others domestic, and a lot of this is really run through a fuel tax on um, um, petroleum in the country, even as they're trying to decarbonize, so they're trying to figure out where else they'll get the revenue or the, or the draw the investment from, but um, paying people to secure climate, purify water, um, provide a range of biodiversity benefits in farmland, and secure scenic beauty for tourism, um, all of these kind of major parts of the economy. And this um, is one component of the dramatic turnaround that Costa Rica made from having the highest deforestation rate in the world to today um, a net reforestation. So I'll just touch briefly on the Caribbean in particular, where um, I know we're not focusing so much on climate adaptation, but where, you know, that's the name of the game these days, sadly, and um, where there's been dramatic shift in mindset and in planning using um, these types of tools to look at the coastal climate protection that could come from restoring habitats or at least protecting existing habitats and being mindful of those habitats that protect people and property from storms um, when um, developing country or regional development plans that integrate across you know, many sectors, transportation, other infrastructure, through to urban systems, um, tourism, mining, forestry, the whole bit. So all of this is being quite integrated. I'm showing a, a tiny example in geographic terms, but one that's been very influential given all of the tragic um, damage that's been sustained in the Bahamas and particularly on this island, Andros Island. And that's now um, really informing together with similar work in other countries in the Caribbean and Latin America more broadly, an investment by the Inter-American Development Bank in this approach across 26 countries to just integrate this science and understanding into development planning and fund development plans that are climate resilient. And finally, I'm gonna to turn too briefly to China that um, I'm gonna show very rapidly just a dramatic um, transformation in policy and in the science and capacity needed to implement these policies toward a green financial system. This comes after you know, many decades of very impressive um, GDP growth that lifted about 850 million people out of poverty that came at a tremendous cost environmentally. So recently the government has added the ecological uh, dimension 
of the nation as a major pillar among five pillars in total of national development. And supporting this, the country has developed by far and away the most sophisticated assessment of its ecosystems. And I'll just show a few slides that show the incredible detail by, uh, with which they're able now to analyze the stocks of natural capital that provide these benefits and the flow of services from these different ecosystem types to people. Um, here the services are shown, and it was found that over the past, the years from 2000 to 2010, that there was actually an improvement in <clears throat> all of these services thanks to the major investments that started being made in environmental protection in China around the turn of the century, following devastating flooding that was traced to deforestation. The one area where there's been a continuing decline is um, biodiversity conservation. So the country um, has responded to all of this by zoning land and declaring sort of priority benefits or stocks of natural capital like biodiversity for restoration and is targeting payments to 200 million people today to conserve and restore ecosystems across the country. There's a lot of um, detail we could get into here. It sort of looks like this in any given place. Every square meter of basically the entire country has now been zoned from both a kind of top-down approach with the central government declaring national priorities that do include carbon sequestration, by the way, but they focus more directly on the locally and regionally uh, delivered and consumed services and um, also through a bottom-up process. They're setting out a whole new massive national park system and um, in paying people really looking at the social dimensions of the elderly populations that are left in many rural areas and in urban areas, really getting to Rob Jackson said something the other day um, about just inspiring people and raising awareness and trying to drive public support for these major investments um, across the cities uh, today, starting with these priority cities. And then just to close, um, I'll end saying that China is really moving past GDP. It looks like it's all yet to be seen, but they've pioneered a way of um, developing a parallel system of accounts for ecosystems to quantify and track change through time in gross ecosystem product uh, that looks at the value of all the goods and services supplied across the country and at many scales in a year. Um, so drawing in data from all those different sources across the country, um, running them, keeping tabs on the actual stocks of natural capital, but looking at the flows of services through this modeling and then in red, you know, revealing the contribution of ecosystems to the economy and society broadly, informing these major financial compensation programs that are underway that involve paying. So a, a city will pay upwind and upstream and up other things, um, regions that supply um, services, whether it's, you know, air and water quality or um, food and just water supply or soil conservation and other things. And then finally, evaluating the performance of policies, leaders, and investments. So I'll close here just um, bringing us back to these opportunities to scale and emphasizing that there's a lot of traction to the major multilateral development banks. And the big question is, how else to partner at a higher system-wide scale now to drive um, standardization of some of these approaches and really, you know, aiming to um, mainstream much more powerfully than has been achieved to date. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. We've got the questions piling up, so I'm going to hand it over to Jenny. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Gretchen. It was a lovely presentation. Um, we'd like to go to Jessica 
Henojosa, uh, sorry for the mispronunciation there, but Jessica, when you're ready, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure, great, thank you. And uh, thanks Gretchen for, for a really, really fascinating presentation. Um, my question is kind of around government buy-in and um, you know, with, with getting governments to kind of agree on the value of natural capital and be willing to invest in it, uh, you know, I've seen things before that say that sometimes actually autocratic leaders or, or leaders in countries where there's long, longer election cycles might be more willing to adopt some of these practices because they can actually see the decadal scale change um, or their return on investment. I'm just curious on your perspective on that and especially, you know, being U.S. based, um, you know, do shorter election cycles make it harder for uh, for government officials to be willing to invest in natural capital? I think you've put your finger on something um, important, but um, I'd also say there, there's so many other factors that um, it's hard to, um, it, for me to see very insightfully into um, where the greatest potential is for um, driving the political um, shifts that we need. So what that's where working with the development banks has actually been very powerful because they come in with a public facing mission. They're tightly, they have very good access to finance ministers, prime ministers and others, and they bring money with them. And so many um, of these development banks have been pioneering relatively small to medium scale demonstrations very successfully and then I think the the public's kind of learning about it as this happens and it's all really over the past very few years you know three to four years so in a way this change is happening at light speed relative to the normal rate of cultural evolution um, but how to bring it here is a crucial question and I'd say we've had quite a bit of traction at the state level but um, uh, since um, uh, the past over the past four years, obviously, uh, no real traction at the at the national level in the U.S. But thanks for that insight. I'm sure you've got your finger on something important um, there. You. Lovely, thank you. And if we have time for one more question, I'd like to go to Shafiq Jaffer. Shafiq. Hi Gretchen, Th thank you for the presentation. I was curious, how can we kind of validate some of these models because it's quite complex coupling across them and to be sure that we're actually taking the right actions. How do you foresee that? I mean, obviously this is still very early stages, so. Yeah, you're raising a very good question. There's been, um, like I referenced really briefly, a tremendous amount of work in some areas. <clears throat> and going back to Rob Jackson and Chris Field, I, you know, they both referenced a lot of work on the interactions of um, carbon and water in forest systems in particular and what you're trading off under different scenarios. So there's some arenas where long predating this effort to integrate it all, we have um, some good understanding of the interactions um, and such, but there are other areas where, like you say, we, um, are just at the beginning of, of really advancing the science and approach. And basically it's just going to take more time with um, a high emphasis on the um, worries that I think you're pointing to that you know we might get it wrong. And um, that's certainly the question you raise is a really important and central one, um, but I, I think beyond focusing on it, working harder and trying to implement some of this and uh, track progress, um, that's probably the best we can do. Thank you.